Let's get started. So welcome everyone to today's session of the Harvard Medical School Organizational Ethics Consortium. Uh, I'm Kelsey Berry. I'm one of the co-chairs of the consortium along with Charlotte Harrison. Uh, Sarah, if you would advance the slide. And today I have the honor to be your moderator um, as we're hearing from our panel of experts on the bioethics of the built environment and how we as health and ethics leaders can advance design for dignity and health. Um, so first, just a warm welcome to the Organizational Ethics Consortium and Happy New Year to all of you. This is our first program uh, of 2023, and we do have several more coming up, as you can see on the right. So this consortium series uh, originated by Drs. Jim Sabin and Charlotte Harrison now about eight years ago. Uh, zeroes in on challenges and opportunities that arise for health organizations. Issues that typically can't be addressed by an individual or individual practitioner alone, but that demand organizational action and also organization level ethics. So we've looked at everything from how hospitals can responsibly integrate social needs programs into their strategic efforts on health equity to how health tech companies can build structures and culture internally to facilitate ethical practice in health innovation, and to the legitimate use of vaccination mandates in health systems and a lot of stuff in between. Um, and through it all, what we aim to do is support a learning community of practitioners and scholars building better health organizations and systems, and as a result, also better societies. So we hope that you will consider yourselves part of this community and join us again for upcoming programs this spring, uh, which Charlotte will mention at the end of the session today. But back to today, um, if you would advance the slide, Sarah. I like to think that by now we've probably all heard about the social determinants of health. Um, and it's likely that many of us in the health sector have spared at least a moment thinking about how to screen, measure, intervene on, or ultimately shift these social factors. And while this work on the social environment is still very much midstream, and there's a lot that's left unanswered, the paradigm shift, right, and the mobilization of health systems increasingly over the past three decades to address these long invisible health factors has been very remarkable. Um, so it's amazing what a little awareness can actually set in motion. And today we have that opportunity again. So we're joined by an interdisciplinary group of physicians, ethicists, and healthcare architects to bring us into the emerging science of the built environment, and particularly how the very buildings in which we practice can shape the health and well-being outcomes we're able to achieve for patients. So how should healthcare respond to this proposition? What role should health organizations play in testing and acting upon it? And what values should inform particular design interventions? We are joined by four experts and an esteemed commentator today who are going to plant the seed with us, so to speak, and really bring us into this puzzle and this opportunity. Um, so meanwhile, before I go much further, let me say a word to you all about your participation in the program today. Um, on the next slide, you'll see there are a few ways to participate. First of all, please go ahead and submit your questions at any time using the Q&A feature that you can access at the bottom of your Zoom screen. We will discuss selected questions at the end of the discussion. And then you could also use the chat box um, to share your thoughts at any time. And in fact, uh, we hope you'll give it a try now by introducing yourselves. Um, so there are way too many of us here to do that verbally, unfortunately. Um, but this platform is really supposed to be a space for um, initiating collaboration and opportunity. And we start that by actually knowing who's in the room. Um, all right, so with all of that, as you all introduce yourselves, and I give you a little example in the chat there, I have the privilege of introducing our speakers and our commentator today. So on the next slide, you'll see their pictures. You can see them live as well. Uh, we're welcoming Diana, Dr. Diana Anderson. So Diana is a board certified healthcare architect, an internist and a geriatrician. We can call her a docatect. Uh, Diana has worked on hospital design projects globally, is the co-founder of the International Clinicians for Design Group, 
and a principal at Jacobs, where she provides thought leadership at the intersection of design and health. Diana is also an instructor of neurology at Boston University School of Medicine, a research fellow in geriatric neurology at the VA Boston Healthcare System, and a past fellow of the Harvard Medical School Center for Bioethics. Uh, so in that respect, we're welcoming her home to the center. So welcome, Diana. We're also thrilled to welcome Stowe Locktetty back to the Center for Bioethics, where he was just recently one of our core faculty and executive editor of the Harvard Bioethics Journal. Stowe is an ASBH certified clinical ethicist, a bioethics educator, and current editor in chief of Pediatric Ethics Scope, the Journal of Pediatric Bioethics. Stowe has a track record of creating program initiatives uh, in healthcare settings to support practice improvements that fundamentally benefit patients, uh, families, and staff. And he's currently a clinical ethicist at Innova Fairfax Medical Campus. We're also welcoming uh, Bill Hercules, founder and CEO of WJH Health, a global consultancy that guides health system C-suite teams in shaping their places of care. Bill is a global expert in healthcare architecture with more than 100 publications and speaking engagements globally, most recently at the intersections of design with finance and ethics. He's past president of the American College of Healthcare Architects and currently serves on the National Strategic Council of the American Institute of Architects. Just recently, Bill served on their COVID Rapid Response Task Force and on the Hospital Surge Capacity Task Force of the International Facilities Guidelines Institute, shaping global facility responses to COVID-19. And then rounding out this team, we're also welcoming Dr. David A. Deemer. David is a bioethicist and an internal medicine resident at the University of Wisconsin. He has published and spoken widely on a variety of topics at the intersection of research, healthcare practice, and ethics, including on methodology and bias in medical education surveys, the ethics of public procurement, and COVID-19 hospital visitation or no visitation policies. So we're really thrilled to have this team of presenters at the forefront of healthcare design and bioethics with us today. We also have, as I mentioned, uh, an expert with us to provide commentary from his perspective and experience in improvement science. That's Dr. Pierre Barker, Chief Scientific Officer of the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. I'll say a few more words about Pierre a little later, um, but wanted to start us off with our presenting team first. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to Bill and Diana to take us away. Great, so we'll just pull up our slides. Thank you so much for the warm welcome home, Kelsey. I used to attend all these sessions as a fellow and it's a real honor to be back um, to speak to all of you today. So we're very excited to be here. We're gonna be talking about what is essentially three years of meeting almost every weekend on a Saturday morning or late on a Sunday, talking about bioethics, healthcare and architecture and what that means. Next slide. Because I think we have quite a varied audience today, I'm seeing everyone's introductions, which are so helpful. Thank you for posting in the chat. Uh, I thought we'd provide a quick sort of overview of what we'll talk about. And I see there are some design and architecture professionals, but probably many are not, and they're clinicians, students, bioethicists. So we'll give a, a brief crash course in healthcare architecture and the current state of healthcare designs research. We'll also then take you into what we're calling sort of two big categories of ethical issues, both in acute care and in long-term care. And we'll give you various examples from the research to try to convince you of some of our um, central thesis that we've explored over the last few years. And we can't really talk about the built environment without also touching on the clinical operations and policies. So we'll also delve into that towards the end and we'll round it out with some ideas of how we can go forward, how we can create change and foster interdisciplinary connections with all of these fields, especially in order to address the, concern that we've, the concerns that we've identified in some of the evidence. So next slide. So our central thesis, what we started talking about just over three years ago is the fact that the built environment as Kelsey alluded to is a parameter of care. And we need to consider that alongside other parameters of care. You know, when I was a medical student a number of years ago, we took a course that spanned all four years called DOC or Determinants of Community Health, where we talked about social determinants of health at length 
This was something we brought into the research sphere, into the clinical space with our patients, but nobody was talking about the physical determinants of health. Now, our main hypothesis and thesis is really that the built environment has as much impact on us as other medical interventions. And essentially it is a medical intervention. So it can affect us just as much as a medication might, swallowing a pill or having a procedure done in a clinical office. It's that important. We spend 90% of our time indoors in North America, at least. Next slide. So through our discussions and meetings, we've been speaking and writing on a lot of these thoughts. We started out a couple of years ago with a blog for the Hastings Center. We've also been trying to write in the architecture engineering space, and we've appeared in some of the popular press magazines like Health Facilities Management. And most recently, we're very proud of our feature story, a feature article in the Hastings Center report called The Bioethics of Built Space, Healthcare Architecture as a Medical Intervention. And we're very happy to share any and all of these publications with anyone listening. Just send us a quick email afterwards. And with that, I'll turn it over to Bill to give us a crash course in health design and the current state of architectural research. By doing this, I'm not going to make anybody a healthcare architect. Um, as a former president of the American College of Healthcare Architects, we, we thought that the baseline education within the healthcare space beyond architectural licensure was at least five years. Um, and uh, many of us have been practicing much longer than that. Uh, but what I am going to do is, is talk about um, healthcare design as a context to why we're even talking about this. There are a number of qualities of the built space that are reasonably well documented uh, uh, and generally inferable uh, associated with how space might affect us. How it, how it looks, uh, whether or not we have access to uh, views of nature, its various lighting effects, you know, uh, acoustic effects, that sort of thing, um, uh, inherently will uh, have some sort of um, positive or, or negative effect on our mood, our, uh, our well-being, et cetera. So uh, what we're going to be doing is diving into what some of this is and then uh, really what we're going to be doing about it. But before we do that, um, I'd like to talk through uh, the essential lack of structure that we have in this space. And this is a pretty bold statement, but unlike medicine, which uh, you might say enjoys, but is clearly uh, regulated in pharmaceutical development or uh, therapeutic procedural development, the practice of architecture really doesn't enjoy that other than what's contained in building codes uh, or uh, various other guidelines. And to be clear, those building codes and guidelines are developed um, with um, very altruistic intent. This is, this is intended to keep people alive, to not imperil people, uh, et cetera. But uh, the practice of design uh, which is wide and varied and includes many more people than just architects. It includes um, engineers and constructors. It also includes uh, people that are using the space and informing the design decisions along the way. In fact, most uh, uh, design projects have literally millions of decisions that, that shape it. So none of those things are generally um, uh, as well regulated as uh, pharmaceutical uh, uh, development. But if we understand sort of the context of a, a, a phrase that is well repeated by many architects, we shape our buildings and then they shape us. It sounds wonderful and august. And of course, it came from Winston Churchill, who had wonderful stage presence uh, and uh, a magnanimous statesman quality. But the context associated with that statement, in my opinion, is even more interesting in that uh, after uh, the uh, Houses of Parliament had been destroyed in the Second World War, the question arose, well, should we rebuild? And his uh, statements in Parliament uh, were not just about, yes, we should because we need to, but the, the form of the architecture really did develop his qualities as a statesman uh, through the House of uh, Lords and House of Commons and, and uh, how all of those, the, the bifurcated or the, the bicameral form of government, how that, how that came together, what it essentially meant. 
And um, all of those qualities really kind of, kind of intersected at the, the point of the architecture. So uh, he concluded his statement with, we shape our buildings and then they have this tremendously powerful effect on us. So uh, we could look at this even historically in the medical space, 150 or so years ago, Florence Nightingale wrote about this and journaled the, the, uh, the deaths of soldiers in the Crimean Wars. And they didn't die from their battle wounds, they died from the environments of care, the cross-contamination from patient to patient, the, the lack of, of air circulation or the lack of uh, isolation uh, between patients. They didn't necessarily all die of their war wounds. In fact, more of them uh, died um, because of that environment of care. So if we look ahead uh, in the succeeding decades, we, we see that there were very deliberate steps to try to correct this and systematize this and become very organized in how we plan uh, hospitals and other places of healing. Uh, all of these things have their own historical context uh, which are much beyond uh, what we're going to be talking about today. But even within the practice of healthcare architecture, um, the AIA, the American Institute of Architects, which began um, uh, even before the Civil War, um, had very deliberate steps forward uh, in developing its own Academy of Architecture for Health. And those architects that are specifically focused in in the space of healthcare, the, the Veterans Administration, for example, uh, had begun to develop its own guidelines associated with uh, care for those that came back initially from the Second World War. Um, various state uh, departments of health did a similar kind of thing. Um, the uh, Academy of Architecture for Health began to uh, adopt some of these um, uh, bigger ideas and, and codify them. Uh, in creating model codes. Um, and these were generally adopted by the American Hospital Association. Uh, fast forward to the turn of the century, the American College of Healthcare Architects was born as a specialty, similar to the American College of, I don't know, you name the, uh, the medical specialty. And even the Center for Health Design began as a way to uh, assemble data associated with the environment's care. But if we look at uh, a single uh, publication that, that somebody might have, and we uh, begin to analyze what that means against all the other publications in the healthcare space, there are almost 5,700 of those. Some of those are not even peer reviewed. But if we look at that against the uh, composite of all 29 million articles, which are all peer reviewed in PubMed, we see the significant disparity between uh, the amount of research specifically around architecture and its effects against all other types of medical practice. So the, uh, there are a number of organizations that are feeding into this. And again, these are very well-intentioned organizations, uh, very well-intentioned professionals uh, that are trying to make things better, but the infrastructure overall is still significantly lacking. In fact, uh, across the United States, the Facility Guidelines Institute, which is represents most states' adoption of healthcare or hospital design codes, is not even 100% across the country. And even those have varying stages of um, previous uh, editions of the codes. So, uh, last year, the uh, International Union of Architects and the um, World Health Organization declared the year 2022 as the year for design for health. This is a very significant kind of event. This brings health and its effects and the architecture of, of health to the forefront globally. There was not one dissenting vote in all of the countries, the 104 countries that are supporting uh, this. And uh, within the United, United States, the American Institute of Architects have made you know, similar kinds of proclamations at various stages. And uh, even abroad uh, in the UK, these are discussions that are still going on. There are a number of people that are very interested in this, but it's a, a larger question of how do we significantly change the tide. So 
um, as uh, it was stated in, in the introduction, uh, I participated in what was originally to be a white paper on addressing hospital surge, brought on principally by the pandemic, but having a much wider lens than just pandemic medicine uh, related to uh, natural disasters or even man-made disasters, mass shootings, God forbid. Um, and what emerged from that was a 700 page advisory tome, which is ultimately going to be used for uh, shaping future business, our future um, uh, building codes. Uh, and it, it was essentially around the hazards and the harms and, and, and safety associated with this. Um, and this ultimately made it um, into CMS uh, to shape how what their expectations might ultimately become. But these are far reaching forward looking documents that will have their own development cycles and their effects really won't be baked into the codes uh, really for the next eight, 12, 16 years. So uh, the, the real question then is, what are we going to do about it? And even well-intentioned uh, interventions, we have to recognize that those interventions are enormously costly. If we, we could look at lessons learned from SB 1953 in California, where after the Northridge earthquakes, uh, hospitals were mandated without funds, of course, to modify their, their infrastructure to withstand earthquakes, which is not an unreasonable request, except there were no funds associated with it. So those uh, requirements kept getting extended and extended and extended. Um, but even code changes are really about minimum compliance. So how many of you actually drive the speed limit? I mean, the bigger, bigger idea is that the codes themselves are not transformational. We need a, a different kind of infrastructure and organizational infrastructure to really uh, uh, transform how we do these things. And the reality is, even if we start now, by the time we get the idea, have projects funded, go through planning and design and construction, that might be uh, an eight to 10 year kind of window. So this is a, a very longitudinal approach that we're trying to take here, but we have to, we have to get it started. So there are, when we first started thinking about this issue, one of the questions was, well, with so little to go on, what kind of framework can we even apply to this? And so one of the most basic ontologies that came out of this was there seemed to be two types of ethical issues that roughly correspond to well-known uh, ethical issues we see in clinical care. And those are roughly the incidental sorts of issues that we're going to discuss, which involve things like the nursing home deaths we've all witnessed with COVID, uh, some data about hand washing and how we can promote uh, better practices in hospitals, and then uh, ICU room design. That's one set of concerns. On the other are deliberate actions that are being taken where things like floor patterns are being used to control wandering of dementia patients, uh, placing uh, dementia patients in immersive settings where they think they are in a different time period or in a different location. And then whether it's appropriate to do research on the built environment outside of any research context, right? There's no IRB or oversight required to put people in a different sort of physical setting uh, to do an experiment right now. Next slide. So the, we are proposing that the accidental or the incidental findings, uh, we engender new responsibilities as we learn about them, right? So sometimes, you know, I will say, we don't want to ask a question if we don't want the answer to it. But some of this information is coming to us, and then it's engendering that responsibility, we argue, to deal with it. And COVID is a great example of this. So here is some data from Canada. Uh, on the left, you see the percentage of the population living in long-term care facilities, 2.1 million people. On the right, you see the proportion of deaths between those living in long-term care and those not. And so if anyone questions the idea of whether or not the built environment has an impact uh, on death, this isn't even taking into account elderly people who have risk factors who don't live in long-term care. These are specific deaths in long-term care itself. Next slide. If we dig a little deeper into the data, we see that roughly 
one third of the nursing homes in Canada were grandfathered into a 1972 design standard, which allowed for multiple occupancy rooms, more communal dining, and several things that are no longer done. That one third of those grandfathered uh, designs was responsible for nearly two thirds of the deaths within nursing homes in Canada. So it's not just the overall setting, it's very specific features of the setting that can have profound effect on health outcomes. Next slide. Another uh, uh, source of, um, another example of what we're talking about is this work that was done by Ariadne Labs and Mass Design, where they studied the impact of the built environment on clinical care and childbirth. And what they found was that the, it's long been known that C-sections are often done for non-clinical reasons. And they found a correlation between the design of the facility and the percentage of cesarean sections that were done. So for example, a facility that has more surgical suites is going to have more C-sections than one that has more spaces for natural birth. And even the location within the facilities, how much transport is required to move a patient from a birth suite to an operating room can affect this. And normally, from a clinical perspective, we think these decisions are made based on clinical criteria, on patients' wishes, on shared decision-making. We don't stop to think that some of our decisions are being influenced by the space that we're in, that we're not as autonomous as we think we are. Next slide. And so, um, Ariadne Labs and Mass Design looked at several different uh, aspects of the built environment, and they were they came up with this model of a pressure tank of a patient flow and what resulted in uh, cesarean births that might otherwise have been vaginal deliveries. And so they looked at these categories of what's the capacity, the volume of of labor and delivery uh, beds, to the nursing staff model, the length of the shift, uh, the workloads, uh, productive incentives, and then the motivation. Of the, of the facility, the operations of, of the facility itself, which David will talk about later. Next slide. And you can see here uh, on the screen, I don't expect you to read all of these. All these are different aspects of the built environment that the study found related to the built environment that affected clinical care. And so when we think about uh, shared decision-making, when we think about deliberation with patients and families, what we are suggesting is that we need to step back and realize that we too are being influenced by the space we're in. That building we walk into every day has an effect on our thinking and thus on our decision, our decisions that we make. Next slide. The other set of, of ethical issues revolves around deliberate efforts to alter behavior. Uh, and this is in generally done in, with very beneficial, uh, uh, beneficent goals to help with issues of housing uh, older, older patients, patients with cognitive impairments, and some evolving science on how uh, impact to certain centers of the brain that accompany dementia can be sort of leveraged uh, to help uh, promote or limit wandering behaviors, which Diana is going to talk about. Next slide. But before we get on to that, in, in the midst of COVID, we would see something like we see here where the drips have been moved outside of the room because of shortages in PPE. So one of the things that this did though was mean there were less eyes on the patient. And this also coincided with visitation restrictions. And so we saw during this period an increase in uh, pressure ulcers, an increase in other uh, uh, hospital acquired injuries because of adaptations we made to the built environment in solving one problem, we create another problem. And so we've got to be very careful about how we think about changing these things that have evolved through time and practice. Uh, and so we really are arguing a systems approach is really necessary for this. These on the fly solutions can create problems that we're not aware of until after the fact. Next slide. All right, so I'm going to take you through a few more examples um, that Stowe alluded to, examples around evidence-based design that improve hospital outcomes or might affect outcomes, and then I'll show some examples around the science of control, specifically in long-term care settings around behavior management for those with dementia by using illusion and deception. 
So this first example is within the intensive care unit acute care setting. This is a really interesting study published in CHEST in 2008. This was done by a co-resident at Columbia Presbyterian where I did my residency. And this is the medical ICU. So what we're showing here graphically is a bird's eye view of the ICU, the intensive care unit. And it's a very traditional, what we call a racetrack design in healthcare architecture. So you have a centralized staff station, and then you have a corridor that runs around it like a racetrack. And then around that, the perimeter of the building, you've got the patient rooms. But you'll notice with our yellow cones of vision, we're basically demonstrating that the corner rooms have less visibility. And what this resident doctor noticed as he was practicing in this unit is that some of his patients he found who went into these corner rooms didn't seem to do as well, and he noticed a pattern. So he wanted to learn more. This was a retrospective study. And he found that if the patients were sicker based on the Apache scoring system within critical care, if they had a higher score and went into the corner room, specifically that lower one to the right, where you only have 4% visibility from the staff station, those patients had higher rates of morbidity and mortality during their subsequent hospital stay. And so I'll just pause and, and have you digest that fact. And also to say that when we go into the hospital and into a particular room for a procedure or for care, we expect and hope that the care we receive from the staff will be equal to the person in the next room. But what if every room in the hospital doesn't actually allow the same opportunity to get better? Next slide. So sinks have you know, been talked about a lot with respect to hand washing during COVID-19 pandemic. This was an interesting study done by some researchers at McGill University. They actually quantified it. So they found that for every additional meter that a healthcare provider needed to walk to a sink, their likelihood of hand washing decreased by about 10%. And you might think that this is pretty intuitive in terms of the numbers and the ratio, but I found that when we present as architects, to healthcare executives, to the decision makers, the people with the dollar signs, it's very important to bring quantitative data like this with us in order to substantiate our design decisions and ideas. Next slide. Here's an example, as Stowe talked about, an incidental ethical issue, which probably was done with the best of intentions, but actually has caused quite a bit of harm for probably many people. This is a geriatric acute care hospital unit in San Francisco. And I want you to notice that all the doors are shut. And if you ask any neurologist or geriatrician on this unit, they will tell you that patients don't come out of their room. They do not walk in this corridor. And we know with good scientific data that bed rest, especially if you're older, is bad. There's no therapeutic value. And most older people who get admitted to hospital end up in nursing home, not because of why they came in. We can certainly treat pneumonias and urinary tract infections, but it's because of the bed rest, right? We immobilize them. And as architects, we tend to design the patient room around the bed as the focal point. We don't necessarily think a lot about mobility, but this corridor is actually impeding mobility in two ways. For one, it's quite shiny and reflective. And we know also based on what happens to the brain with cognitive impairment, and as you age, there's a higher incidence of cognitive impairment, that this is interpreted as wet or slippery and can be kind of scary to walk along if you're old and frail. So you might not. But I want you to look at the floor pattern and the colors as well. You'll notice this sort of alternating horizontal striping pattern. Now, this was probably a very well-intentioned design decision, probably for aesthetic reasons made early on in the schematic design process, but it's actually inhibiting anyone from mobilizing outside their rooms and walking down the corridor. And while this is an accidental or incidental ethical issue, um, there's actually good evidence that exists. And so the question is, you know, whose responsibility is it to access this evidence? And as the doctors and nurses talked to me about when I was rotating through here, they said, you know, what should we do now? Do we have a duty to actually rip out this floor? and put in a new one. Next slide. I became so interested in this issue that I actually just published a literature review on about a dozen of these studies that actually study design interventions at egress doors or exit doors in secured dementia facilities, so locked units. How can we use design to inhibit people from leaving with the intention of keeping them safe? We don't want them to walk outside and get hit by a bus. We want them to, to maintain their safety. But what's really interesting is if you take masking tape and place it in horizontal bars, like you can see on the left-hand graphic, people with dementia will not approach the door. If you turn that tape 90 degrees to be more vertical, as I'm demonstrating with the graphic on the right, they will just pass those stripes and exit right on out that door. 
And so these design-based approaches are actually using vision and perception changes that happen in the brains of those with dementia. We know there's a visual variant now of Alzheimer's disease, posterior cortical atrophy. Uh, they're basically using these changes in the brain to decrease dangerous behaviors. And these interventions are relying on creating a misperception of the space. We believe that the horizontal stripes to someone with dementia might appear like a three-dimensional staircase that might not be so welcoming for someone who's old and frail to cross. So what does it mean to be a medical intervention if the floor pattern actually causes a state that's quite similar to using medication? Right, to prevent wandering, we can sedate someone, we can use physical restraints, which we have come away from. But is there a difference between using medications to limit wandering for people who live with dementia or using architecture to induce an illusion or psychological state to basically achieve the same end? And what we suggest in our Hastings Center manuscript is that this requires ethical oversight that we don't believe exists today. Next slide. We use other techniques to try to pacify long-term care residents if they become agitated or upset. You know, the memory impairment isn't the most concerning symptom to most caregivers. It's the BPSD, the behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia. So these are assisted living facilities um, out in California, and one of them has used an old car. So if someone becomes upset or agitated, they're escorted to the car, and they sit in an older car, which we believe they probably used at some point in their life in their younger years. And as soon as they're calm, they're escorted back. Same thing with that fake bus stop, right? So these architectural elements are really designed to avoid, avoid any indignities of sedation. We don't wanna use sedation if we can help it and give people who might not be able to act safely on their own a sense of autonomy and control. But the natural progression of using these types of illusions that deceive is actually complete immersion, which has also been done architecturally. And the next slide shows you the dementia village. So the original village is in the Netherlands, the Hodgewick, but there are a number of other villages that have popped up across the globe. And this is quite different as a model. There, these are not locking doors or using floor patterns. Instead of limiting wandering, the dementia village actually promotes permissive wandering to combat any confusion or spatial disorientation by means of creating an artificial reality. And some scholars have likened it to the Truman Show, right? The design creates a sense of freedom, but that's entirely an illusion. There's no actual open door to the outside world. You have your own little apartment. You're free to come and go. You can go down to the supermarket and buy a real apple, take a real bite, but the money you're using is artificial. You can go to the barber, to a pub, but ultimately this is a gated dwelling uh, unit. And so is there a right to reality for these people living with dementia or is living in this false sense of reality in some cases appropriate? And some scholars have even written about advanced deception directives, thinking about advanced care planning with some of these issues in the clinic setting, or even informed consent. When you're looking at nursing homes for your loved one, are you being told we use floor patterns to prevent wandering, to incite fear or discomfort instead of medication? And typically we're not told about any of that. So these are some of the emerging ethical issues we've seen in long-term care design that don't really have any research or oversight, but we believe should. The illusion that people are free to leave, but they're not carrying out plans or goals when that's not possible. These immersive environments convincing people they're in a different place or time, and then controlling behavior through different design interventions. And so these aren't really different, we believe, than any interventions we undertake in medical or pharmaceutical development. And with that, uh, I'm going to move on to another example that actually has good data, right? The dementia village doesn't have good evidence. There are anecdotal reports, but we don't have good available evidence. But we do have great evidence for the greenhouse model for nursing home design or the household model. And just brief briefly, this is a graphic that illustrates the concept. Again, a floor plan bird's eye view, 10 to 12 single resident rooms with adjoining private bathrooms around a smaller decentralized living space, always with direct outdoor access. Next slide. And if you look at the data from COVID, it's, it's quite shocking. Every time I look at it, I'm just surprised. Um, what we're looking at here is A, B, and C. We're looking at COVID cases per thousand resident days in A, COVID-19 admissions in B, and COVID-19 deaths in C. And you can see the far left purple bar, which you really don't see at all, are all of these bad outcomes in greenhouse model units, which there's almost none, versus traditional nursing homes of less than or over 50 beds. And it's quite striking the difference. Next slide. And you might say, well, 
that's probably pretty expensive to do. But actually greenhouse homes have great evidence around them for improved quality of life. We're not just talking about infection control, we're talking about people enjoying their day-to-day -day time, less hospital admissions and less staff turnover. So there's a lot that's been written about patient and resident experience, but almost nothing about staff burnout and the physical environment. And they aren't necessarily more expensive. One paper actually showed that operational costs are pretty similar and that there's actually some return on investment based on some of these additional benefits. And so I think on that note of costs and operations, I'll turn it over to David to take us through some of the policy concerns when we think about architecture. Thanks, Diana. So does the evidence and reasons we've outlined mean that your healthcare system needs to rebuild their hospitals? Um, I would say not necessarily. Um, policies govern how we live and work within spaces and can mitigate the harmful effects of a given space on the care provided. Um, they're flexible. These can be rapidly implemented and cost a lot less than a new hospital building. Um, so we can go to the next slide here. We're going to talk about some policy uh, in the coming slides. Um, and I'd really like to emphasize this point for those in the audience who are students or in leadership positions, uh, because the policies that you make can recognize and mitigate the harms of a given physical environment. Um, you know, the ideas that we're sharing today don't always demand a new facility. What they do demand is that we recognize the impact of the built environment on health and take steps to promote the best care environment possible for our patients. Um, so this uh, schematic here I created uh, to kind of help organize several different built environment related interventions cited in the popular press um, that you may have read articles about. Um, the X axis is flexibility, the Y uh, is time to implement. Uh, and so you can see here certain interventions are flexible, uh, some are less flexible, um, some can be implemented quickly, some take time in planning. Um, and I'm going to highlight an example from visitation policies um, as an example of something that's flexible, rapidly implemented, fairly inexpensive, yet relates to the physical environment in many respects. Um, and I'm also going to talk about this because I think it's something that most everyone in the audience, uh, either directly or potentially, um, you know, second degree, um, has known someone who had a very strong experience related to hospital visitation policies during the pandemic. Next slide. So I'd like to highlight this study. Um, this was co-authored by Quint Studer. Some of you may be familiar with him. Um, it was looking at the impacts of visitation policies on uh, HCAPs uh, and patient safety indicator outcomes uh, for a sample of 32 hospitals uh, during the initial stages of the COVID pandemic. Um, these ranged in size from small community hospitals to tertiary academic medical centers. Um, this first graph here that I'd like to highlight uh, shows the months of 2020 and the percentage of facilities in this sample that reported a strict no visitation uh, policy implementation during those months. Um, and if you can kind of remember the ebb and flow and the surges of COVID, um, in many respects, this very much matches um, the times of uh, intense COVID intensity um, and health system strain. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Um, and some of the outcomes I'd like to highlight here that Stowe alluded to earlier, um, there were some changes um, in HCAPS domain measures. You can see the three columns, open visitation, uh, open limited visitation, and then strict no visitation. Um, the most significant difference was in responsiveness of hospital staff. Fairly small uh, percent differences really between the HCAP scores, but where we really saw significant differences was related to patient, patient safety uh, composite measures related to pressure ulcers uh, in hospital falls uh, with fractures um, and then also development of sepsis. Um, and I was just struck when I read this the first time about the size of the percentages. Um, you know, even the 28% increase with pressure ulcers is remarkable. Having uh, a rate where things are doubling um, is very, uh, very, very significant and I found very compelling. Uh, let's go to the next slide. And so as you think about the pros and cons related to, you know, a strict no visitation policy versus some degree of visitation allowed, um, you know, strict no visitation policies um, can allow for more effective disease isolation, uh, particularly if your PPE is limited 
um, if the hospital is in a financially difficult position where they cannot afford to maybe increase PPE to facilitate that. Um, but as I mentioned here, we can see that that's been associated with uh, increased uh, you know, adverse medical outcomes. Um, other studies that I've cited here have noted that these strict no visitation require, uh, policies resulted in increased staff communication burden, less goals of care changes, um, you know, from a more um, uh, philosophical level, loss of patients lifeline to reality. Um, and I would argue too, a certain degree of disconnect between uh, the public life uh, and the realities of illness and death that many of the medical practitioners were seeing on a daily basis in the COVID pandemic, but many people, uh, you know, who were not in the medical profession, I think, were, were somewhat shielded from. Um, whereas, you know, allowing some degree of limited visitation allows you to uh, mitigate some of those uh, adverse associations, um, you know, with the understanding, though, that it may cost more. You may have to purchase um, additional PPE um, to facilitate that. Let's go to the next slide. So I highlighted the study to show how policy can affect outcomes in a given space. Um, it relates to the built environment because a hospital's ability to safely allow visitation is related to its design. If a hospital has, let's say, less HVAC capabilities, smaller room sizes, they may legitimately be able uh, less able, I should say, to offer safe visitation. Um, design, therefore, can either promote or make more difficult activities conducive to good patient care. However, just like each patient's body is unique or follows the principles of physiology, each hospital is unique, and the principles of design and health may not change, but the way they play out within a given space can vary, and so this needs to be studied intentionally and consistently. Um, and that's kind of the, the emphasis here of the policy action slide. Um, we're gonna go to one final example, and we can go to the next slide. Um, you know, let's try to apply this to a real uh, hospital unit. Um, and I'm gonna use my uh, home institution's medical ICU here. Uh, this image is part of a public press release during the COVID surge. You can see people gowned up. Um, and you can see a similar variant of the racetrack design that Diana mentioned. This is triangular. We'll get a better schematic here in just a second. Um, but I'd like to highlight a few design elements here that are kind of unique. Um, Bill, if you can click through a couple of these. Um, you'll see here several elements circled in red. Um, and then one more bill, if you could click through. You'll also see what's unique is that around this racetrack design, there's a skylight above that, and you can see the light coming in there. Um, and then the patient rooms are around the outside. You can actually see windows from the patient rooms facing up towards that sunlight to bring the natural light in. Why is this a part of this ICU's design? This ICU is unique because it is centrally located deep in the hospital, several levels down, and many of the patient rooms around the outside do not have windows to the outside. So we can go to the next slide, and you can get a kind of a better, uh, you know, visual representation of this. Um, the red areas here are, are natural light wells that can bring in natural light, um, and so the rooms that are next to those do have some windows. Um, the yellow uh, triangular racetrack. You can see there's sunlight's coming in from there and coming into the rooms. But you can see there's quite a lot of rooms that beyond that uh, natural light from the racetrack do not have any, um, you know, significant connection to the outside, um, which can make, um, you know, rates of delirium sometimes higher in these rooms. And so this is kind of an interesting question. If we go to the next slide, overall, what's the net effect of this design? Right. Um, in some senses, there are pros to this design. Um, this particular racetrack, uh, all the rooms have pretty equal visibility um, from this central nursing station model. The ICU is centrally located and easily accessible from the rest of the hospital. Um, there's a lot of natural light in the hallways, um, which is very beneficial for staff, which are usually sequestered kind of in the middle of a building um, without much of uh, indication of day and night cycles. Um, and of course, you know, allowing for an interprofessional collaborative space in the middle is also a pro. However, there is a lack of windows in many of the patient rooms um, and temperature control can sometimes be difficult, um, which is uh, not uncommon in older facilities. Um, and so we can go to the next slide. And so 
you know, how does this play out? Um, and I actually advanced this slide, Bill, if you can go back one more. Um, you know, how do we figure this out? What, what is the overall net effect of this, right? Um, specifically here, does the improved visibility result in a net positive impact on patient care, even without the external windows? Um, I think we're gonna be able to answer this question and those like it when we treat things like lines of sight, floor patterns, natural light, and other design elements like medications. PPE, nursing ratios. Um, these are all elements of care that influence patient outcomes and therefore warrant continuous institutional research. Um, and this is really the next step that we're advocating for. And once we can understand our care environments better, um, we believe that hospitals can make better decisions, both in, of course, building better designs, but also in implementing policies that can mitigate the harm the environment poses to patient outcomes and can kind of serve as a bridge to these more permanent built interventions. Um, and with that, uh, we'll go to Stowe to do a summary. Yeah, I'm looking at the time, so I wanna wrap this up quickly. Uh, there are sort of these three takeaways that we're, we're gonna leave you with here. And one is, the primary one is that the funding and scholarship um, examining these questions, uh, discerning if there is a there there, is really needed in this. Um, you know, these these ethical issues um, are things that have parallels, as uh, Lachlan pointed out uh, in the chat, to well-known, well-understood ethical concerns like nudging. Uh, and so we we suggest that bioethicists need to engage with both healthcare architects and uh, the healthcare community in general to raise this issue as to something that can be examined alongside the other parameters of care which are already routinely studied. And so with that, I'll thank you very much and turn it back over to Kelsey. Thanks, Stowe. Thanks, David, Bill, and Diana. Um, this is an incredible uh, way to plant the seed with a lot of people who I imagine have not really looked carefully at the halls that they walk and ask these kind of critical questions. What do we know, right, about how they might impact what we do and what we're able to do for others? Um, so with that, I think what I'd like to do, there's plenty of opportunity to turn to questions and to unpack, but I wanted to turn it over first to our commentator, Dr. Pierre Barker. Um, for his initial reflections um, on this topic. And so just a word about Pierre um, before he gets us started. Uh, as I said earlier, he's the Chief Scientific Officer of the Institute for Healthcare Improvement um, and is also Clinical Professor of Pediatrics in the Maternal and Child Health Department at Gillings School of Global Public Health at UNC Chapel Hill. And so with IHI, Pierre's had a lot of uh, extensive and deep experience designing effective health improvement interventions for health systems globally, um, and then also cultivating a learning community around improvement science and methods for healthcare. Um, so he's done this in a variety of different settings and types of economies, working closely with the World Health Organization um, as well. We're really thrilled to have Pierre with us. Um, Pierre, you'll have to correct me, but I sometimes think about the nature of what IH does is something like where the rubber hits the road or where ideas become effective strategies and actions, right, and a commitment to actually studying what we do so that we can continually do it better. Um, but with that little preamble, let me turn it to Pierre for your thoughts. Thanks very much, Kelsey, and, and thank you to these uh, remarkable uh, presentation, which is really uh, fascinating. And I I am grateful on the one hand to have an opportunity to weigh in on this amazing, fascinating subject, but I, I think I need to start with full disclosure. So while I'm deeply curious about the topic, I am certainly not a trained ethicist, and I have um, amateur aspirations to be a, an architect. Um, uh, but I am learning a phenomenal amount from this presentation, and, and Diana, I will definitely be talking about physical determinants of health uh, going forward. Um, I do feel a bit more confident when reflecting on my experience, both as a clinician and also as a, a systems improvement scientist. I've worked in a number of healthcare environments across the world, and this topic uh, really has uh, come up, and, and I'll talk a little bit about that. So, I mean, personally, as a clinician, I had great awareness about how my working environment affected uh, both the effectiveness and, and safety of what I was doing, uh, 
But most importantly, I think it affected the happiness of my work. And I remember um, the day I stepped into the newly built children's hospital uh, in uh, Chapel Hill at UNC, and it's sort of huge spaces which were filled with light and color. And it, it was just a completely transformational experience for me and one which I, I remember uh, very, very clearly. So, but I'd like to reflect uh, on today's presentation um, in my sort of, with a hat of uh, an improvement scientist. Uh, and, and I think there is uh, some of our work at IHI in, in the realm of, of our, uh, particularly in, in the realm of where, do, where does this field go potentially next, um, uh, where we've bumped into the built environment and, and, the, and some of the questions about uh, bioethics. I'll focus my commentary on three areas that I think came up on the presentation. I think Stowe highlighted some of them in this summary um, and that relate to this intersection of the built environment, bioethics, and importantly for me, the, the, the opportunities maybe that improvement science uh, has to offer. The first of the three is really uh, the extent of patient and family, family engagement in, uh, in the design uh, in the design process and in the testing uh, of the design changes. And, the, and for us, uh, the starting point of any really design process is to answer the question, which is what, what matters most uh, to the patients that we're trying to serve. And, and I see Lachlan Farrow already put in the chat a reference to the spirit of nothing about you without you. Uh, at IHIS, we, we, we start with the assumption that patients can best inform us about what the true needs of the situation are, but we do need to ask them uh, and, and involve them very deeply in that inquiry. And, and that those who are closest to take, taking care of those patients probably have the best ideas uh, for how to respond to those needs that have been identified. So I think that some of the bioethical questions that were raised during the presentation um, uh, and more generally in the field uh, may be addressed especially, and I think I'm thinking about the uh, long-term care geriatric dementia space, um, I think might be addressed through more intentional design collaboration with families. And even in the case of the long-term care homes in pre-dementia patients, maybe uh, about the intended design and certainly uh, going forward about the effects uh, of the designs, especially some of the more um, edgy um, <laughs> examples that we saw uh, today. Um, we've had some experience uh, of, of uh, really thinking about very intentionally about the built design environment. We, we uh, worked on the pervasive issue uh, of lack of dignity and respect in women uh, giving birth in low middle income countries. And we, we uh, are working in both Ethiopia and, and Bangladesh on that. And we had an opportunity to collaborate with Mass Design uh, who you've seen uh, referenced in the chat, uh, in collaboration with two local architectural firms in those two countries, uh, as well as uh, the ministries and importantly providers and patients. We started our inquiry with a very deep discussion uh, with patients and, and families and patient companions uh, on this topic in order to really understand the impact specifically of the environment on our goal of improving uh, dignity uh, and respectful care. Um, the conclusion was um, with these deep inputs that there were in fact opportunities in, the, in these contexts for amending uh, space uh, rather than rebuilding, um, uh, although both uh, were required in different contexts. And for the uh, adaptation of spaces, this is exciting because it does offer opportunities for doing much more adaptive design and much more testing. Um, so we would be able to amend uh, existing spaces to try to accommodate the needs that were identified by uh, patients uh, and, and their families. Um, in, in but even for the situations, and we've heard about the expanse uh, of of sort of the big type. So a really good example in that situation is because of the distances as mothers have to travel, uh, this idea of maternity waiting homes where mothers would come in the last uh, few weeks of their pregnancy so that they'd be right there, that requires a new building, a new type of building, and you can't adapt existing buildings to that. But even in that process, there was a deep uh, um, iterative 
uh, design, even at the prototyping phase, uh, that involved uh, patients, families, and 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 their companions. So uh, this is so for me, that's the kind of number one uh, potential um, ad. I think is is this intentionality around in, involving patients uh, and their families, and I and I think when it comes to the uh, ethics uh, of this, I think. And especially when you get to these dramatic designs that we saw today, uh, I, I can't imagine how you could test something like that, especially in the situation where the, the patients themselves can't uh, um, uh, engage on the, in the discussion on, on the outcomes. I think engaging families, and uh, as I say, might, might be good uh, uh, as well as that. So the second... Um, idea really is just uh, what can we learn from using the tools of improvement science, particularly um, learning, iterative learning um, and systems thinking to guide these designs. And I've, I've, I've spoken a little bit about our experience in, in Bangladesh and, and Ethiopia, but I think there is uh, more of an opportunity here, I think, to incorporate um, the uh, the ideas uh, that you that that we've learned from from the from the studies now to move those into prospective designs that actually use uh, rapid cycle improvement thinking. Uh, I want to give an example. We've been very deeply involved in the problem of cesarean section, and I mentioned this because of the work uh, of Neil Charles that was mentioned in the presentation. Um, we've worked in the country of Brazil. Brazil has the dubious distinction of having the highest rates of cesarean section in the world. If you, if you uh, are, are a woman who wants to deliver in the private sector, you have a 90% chance uh, that your baby will be delivered by a cesarean section. Uh, Neil's work showed the importance uh, of the, both the numeric and spatial relationships of labor wards and, and operating rooms. Um, there is an extreme example in the, in the main hospital partner that we worked with uh, in Sao Paulo, where the labor room, every labor room was a potential operating room. So you could convert the labor room into an operating room. So in Neil's calculation of steps between rooms, there were zero steps. Uh, at, at the flick of a switch, this room turns into an operating room. So you can see the incentive by the built design for driving uh, um, uh, uh, laboring women into cesarean section. The solution, which was testable by a, a, a small adaptive design, let's move low-risk women four floors up Okay, into a, into a, into a different space completely. So, but this gets again into the the methodology of improvement, which is we couldn't have done this without intensive collaboration, not just from the patients and 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 their families, but from the obstetricians who immediately raised multiple objections, saying this was a dangerous thing to do, uh, despite all the evidence from around the world that that's actually how many many um, uh, obstetric units work. Um, so um, really, this process of 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 getting everybody on the same page and 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 arriving at a design that is testable, because we said, okay, let's just try this out. It's not a big deal to move uh, a woman into existing spaces. Um, uh, we could try it out. Uh, let's see what happens. And we then had data to show that the women who were moved there, same matched women, had much lower cesarean section rates. So we were able to do that uh, without the risk of a massive um, build out uh, that was expensive and, and potentially irreversible. Um, the, the final thing I want to say, which just sort of builds on this, is using um, uh, improvement uh, study designs uh, to really test a lot of the good uh, and interesting uh, data that is accumulating in this field. Uh, I mean, we heard about the fact that there is there are small numbers of studies. I would argue that the studies that, that we saw presented today are pretty much all observational and even some of them were anecdotal. They're all retrospective. I didn't see much uh, in terms of good matching. Um, and so they do risk uh, that the evidence on which some very profound decisions are being made are potentially uh, at risk of bias. Um, and, and I think then, then the next step is what do you do with those data? And, and, and at every opportunity, I would say, uh, that there should be both in terms of the, the co-design that, uh, that the idea that we started with, but also this idea that we can perturb the environment uh, both both in a prototype way and also in a in an actual way um, uh, while looking at the results of those tests before committing uh, 
to to massive, expansive, uh, more lasting uh, design changes. Um, so I think that there is a lot uh, that we could be doing uh, with with the with the data at hand. I understand I'm I'm speaking about something that I have limited understanding of, but I'm just wondering as I'm hearing the presentation whether there isn't a lot of opportunity for uh, actually much more testing uh, of, of ideas uh, and much more manipulation of the existing spaces. So in summary, two ideas, deeper engagement of, uh, of uh, patients and families, and secondly, more iterative, adaptive designs uh, for tension for, for, for the ideas that, that, that exist. So back to you, Kelsey. Thanks so much, Pierre. Um, so we are, uh, we've got plenty of time for questions and exchange. I do want to remind those who joined us late, if you've got a question, please put it in the Q&A box. If we don't get to your question, we're going to capture all of them um, because the aim of this is to have continuing work rather than today to be the last moment in which you get to think about this and we all get to work on it together. Um, so just uh, before we turn, though, to the audience questions, I wanted to give uh, Bill, Stowe, Diana, David, an opportunity to reflect back on what Pierre shared. Um, I've got a few thoughts, but <laughs> I, will, I will first open it up um, to our speakers in thinking about um, what they can take away from, from Pierre's comments and questions that they might have as well. I might make a quick comment and sort of ask Bill to, to weigh in as our seasoned healthcare architect. And Pierre, I I completely agree about user um, involvement. And we we do that to a certain degree as healthcare architects, but I guess the comment back to Bill is we really don't have a standard way to do that. And it becomes very project specific whereby that feedback is owned by the client. Um, and how can we make that much more like clinical medicine research where the results might be generalizable into something that is very successful? How can that be accessed by other projects, other architects? And I don't know whether, Bill, we think that maybe the process of design needs to change and that user engagement needs to change at the architecture level or at the client level. I just wanted to throw that out, but I definitely agree. That is something we've talked about at length in our group. If uh, someone is comes into a hospital for a knee replacement, there are standard protocols associated with that knee replacement. Uh, uh, there, It's not dependent on uh, the titanium parts that make up the, the replaced knee. Uh, the protocols are very well orchestrated, uh, even to a point of if, if you vary from them, you risk malpractice. Those kinds of controls, and those are tight controls, simply don't exist in the design space. And the culture of design is such that um, it, it demands an enormous amount of freedom. But even within that freedom is an enormous responsibility to accept uh, a very clear process around this. So consequently, uh, from one firm to the next firm or from one project team within a firm to another project team within a firm, the process of that design has some level of variation, some small, some rather significant. But Diana, to your point, there is typically not a a process around this is how you do it uh, other than an iterative kind of di uh, level of discovery. Uh, similarly, there is within that project itself, not a financial mechanism to support a deeper level of uh, research inquiry. So at best, uh, project teams are reliant on previous research that they've become aware of, or if in the middle of a design project, emerging research um, is discovered, there's very little opportunity to incorporate that emerging research uh, into a project that's sort of half, half designed or half built. So uh, the, the overall process, I think, needs a significant shakeup, but it's not just uh, codifying that process in a professional kind of way, um, uh, but it's 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 also developing the the research infrastructure uh, to support it. Neither of which neither of which are are uh, in well established norms yet. And that's not just about the architectural practice. That's how the services are essentially procured, and that relates to how requests for proposals are written 
uh, or what the expectations are. And typically when projects happen, funds have been secured and uh, those funding fights have, have taken years and, and there's some fatigue associated with that from an administrative standpoint. So, okay, let's get a designer, let's get a contractor, let's get on with it. Uh, uh, so it, by that point, it's a matter of executing uh, a collection of ideas that might be based in research or not, but it's very difficult to sort of back the train up and ask some fundamental questions when, uh, when the money has been secured and everybody's expecting that there are timelines and other project controls that, that have to be met. So it winds up being a very a strange process. But in terms of the, the actual uh, uh, process of design, it really needs to begin much sooner than um, this is what we're going to design, let's go. I think the culture is also quite different, right? That, you know, if you are a resident or a fellow, you can write up a really bad experience and that actually can help your career, right? I have a hard time seeing an architecture firm writing up how badly something went and it being anything but disastrous, right? And th there's no sort of mechanism. For, and so that sort of leads us to this question that the four of us have talked about a lot, which is you can't be you know, uh, morally responsible for something you have no control over. So who is responsible for this, right? I think, you know, Bill's talked about how the average hospital CEO has a tenure of what, like five and a half years, five and a half years. right? And so most of these projects span a CEO, numerous levels of high level management. So we sort of have a tragedy of the commons problem uh, here, at least when it comes to new construction. You know, one of the, the points that we really started with and, um, you know, at the very beginning was to say, what if we were to think of the building as a medical intervention, um, you know, and, and what would it look like if health systems weren't to engage it as such, you know, and exactly so, as you said, there is a difference in culture um, in healthcare versus other sectors. And so really being able to ask critical questions about, you know, what are the values that exist in healthcare that would be beneficial to move into collaboration with design and architecture? And where might there be some instances in which we've um, not been our best selves in healthcare such that we are, you know, you know not just looking to wholesale take over um, what is, you know, an architectural and design-based practice. Uh, I did want to pick up on the idea that, you know, if healthcare were to consider buildings as medical interventions, maybe the first responsible step would be to ensure that we're using them in these evidence-based ways. Um, and Bill just brought us through, you know, some of the challenges um, to developing evidence that projects don't necessarily have funds associated with further study of the impacts. Uh, David, earlier we were discussing this um, question of what might be some of the structures or, or ways of generating evidence um, that you that you've thought about. Uh, do you want to jump in on that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think this is a, a good time to kind of uh, speak a little bit more to that. Um, you know, the, the COVID pandemic has impacted everyone in a variety of ways. And I think it is now is a good time to be thinking about these kinds of design related issues because of the, I think, increased prominence um, that they've had in a lot of people's um, experience working in healthcare. And one of the things that our group has kind of talked about in terms of this responsibility, in terms of next steps, in terms of, you know, who could do the kind of research that we are advocating for. Um, as Bill said, you know, it's, it, it would be great if it was in architecture. It'd be great if it was a part of the culture. If the funding existed, it doesn't. Um, you know, healthcare systems are already, uh, you know, in a very difficult position coming out of the pandemic. Um, you know, we have discussed with some architects, um, you know, is this a potential source of liability coming up where we need to be worried about um, litigation in some respects if things are not updated to a certain standard? Um, I, I think what I would propose as a, as a good next step and a good home for this would be within the pre-existing quality improvement and process improvement structure that already exists in hospitals. Um, you know, we already look at uh, a lot of patient outcomes, um, and we're not necessarily saying the outcomes that we look at need to change. Um, you know, I think what would make sense is for the hospitals uh, 
to conduct this kind of research under the umbrella of QI and PI. Um, you know, we understand and already kind of have a, a culture that these activities are related to organizational improvement um, and thus have a different kind of level of um, both protection and, um, you know, they're not subject to the same kinds of IRB approval um, that other kinds of studies are. Um, these are things that, as uh, Pierre has mentioned, um, lend themselves well to let's try this and see how it goes. Um, they can be, I think, very successful when uh, incorporating feedback from a lot of these different key stakeholders, be it families, patients, nurses, et cetera, who see and work in these environments uh, from a firsthand basis. Um, and, you know, the, the department is already there, the infrastructure is already there to really incorporate this with the other elements that we know go into clinical care. And so I think that's one area that um, myself, some of the other, um, you know, of my colleagues on the line have seen as uh, potentially a fertile, um, you know, planting ground for this idea um, in terms of making it tangible, starting to apply it, starting to do the kind of intentional follow-up on uh, implementation that we advocate. Well, David, the, the, the issue, though, of trying something and just seeing how it goes uh, is really kind of fraught with all kinds of ethical issues that have to be sorted out in concert with the development of the research itself. So uh, um, as the only non-ethicist within our team, so I have to join Dr. Barger here, uh, this is, I think, a, a fundamental issue that, that we do have to wrestle with uh, in terms of getting real patients in with, with real diseases, uh, a real understanding of this is a continuous, you're participating in a continuous process improvement um, kind of thing. So. Um, we're going to be doing some things that we think are going to be more helpful than not doing them, uh, but there may be some other uh, things that we have to talk about. So at least uh, some, some level of informed consent or something like that. But um, maybe you and Stoke can discuss some of the ethical issues associated with that kind of an approach. I'll, I'll, I'll comment briefly and see if Stowe has anything else that he'd like to, to add to it. Um, you know, the, I think, you know, my understanding of, of why quality improvement and process improvement um, may not have to go through the same kind of IRB vetting as a lot of other types of uh, institutional research, although it is related to patient outcomes and things that matter, um, is related to the process that Pierre mentioned, right, that we start uh, with these focus groups to try and identify the relevant changes that need to be made. Changes are made incrementally um, and generally starting small um, with iterative changes being made at each kind of cycle of expansion and of, of application. Um, and so I, you know, there, I, I agree with you that transparency is, is a great thing in healthcare um, and overall the movement of healthcare is moving towards increased transparency, which I think is a good thing. Um, being more transparent with our patients and their families about the process improvement that's going on in our hospitals, I think is also a really good thing uh, in many respects. Um, and this can, I think, be a part of that as well. And I think it's something patients would largely appreciate um, you know, that's going on. Again, it has to be done responsibly and, and that's been kind of uh, discussed, uh, I think for several decades within that space. Is there anything else though that you wanted to- no, I, I agree with all that. I, I think though that some of these things, we, we haven't really come up with the, the best ontology for carving these up because like in long-term care, I have met patients who absolutely want a locked door. They don't want a mural that hides the door handle. They don't want stripes on the floor. They want reality. And other patients that I've seen would absolutely be fine with it. It's like, if you can avoid sedating me and dragging me back to my room, by all means, whatever, you know. And so, you know, how these things are, you know, one other thing that maybe, Diana, you could talk about the de-aging mirrors, like to, to give the audience an idea of, of how far this goes, um, the kinds of yeah. interventions that are being considered. Uh, certainly. I mean, I consult for a number of developers who are considering ideas without any user uh, intervention, Pierre, but thinking about employing magic mirrors or magic windows in assisted living facilities. So if you're in downtown Toronto in an assisted living facility with mild cognitive impairment or mild dementia, all of the windows will be controlled by someone else. So you're looking at views of LA, 
or Australia, you don't necessarily see Toronto, which is where you're living, or any mirror where you look at yourself, you won't see your reflection at your current age. It will only be a version of a younger you in these magic mirrors. And we have sort of made that decision without asking anyone. And I, and I should say that I do, I do research with people who have dementia and it is possible to involve them in these research studies. It's, it's very possible and it's very appropriate. They're certainly able to tell us what they like at a certain time and place in that moment. And I think that has value, but the, the magic mirrors uh, took me by surprise and was quite uncomfortable to, to hear about that this is being employed in different projects. I guess maybe we could bring Pierre in on this. I, I'm just wondering about, you know, Pierre, as you see some of the efforts unfolding to, you know, implementation strategies and are working with uh, health systems that are trying new things. Um, do you see there being ethical oversight uh, in the in the work that um, you're you're partnering with them on? Um, and what allows, if you do, what allows that oversight to be uh, constructive? in that kind of process. Yeah. So as I've sort of put in the chat, I think the problem is, and I don't know the field well enough, but I can talk in principle that the most of the quality improvement work, pretty much all the quality improvement work that we embark on where there is actual intervention, where we're testing interventions um, that are exempt from IRB review are ones which rely on standard evidence. So we know that this works. This is why we didn't need IRB permission to move the patients to the seventh floor of that Brazilian hospital because there is evidence that it's actually safer for uh, low-risk women to labor quietly um, without the, the, the risk of, of premature um, transfer to operating room. That, ex that exists. So we could do that easily and test that. Um, I, I think that, uh, you know, and I'm just thinking about some of the examples that we saw today around the effect of light or, or the movement of beds in an ICU, it's compelling and it's intuitively right, but uh, is there harm? Is there un, un, ex, uh, unpredicted harm that might occur from that? I think that probably needs to be formally tested. Um, and there is an opportunity to do that. Um, uh, so I think that it shouldn't I think there's some things that if you have a, a, enough degree of belief in the evidence that you could subject to a pretty rapid uh, testing to see how to do that, those those good ideas. And, and so most of the QI work that we do is really about the how, not about the what. Uh, but I think that there is some work that it seems like needs to be done in this field with all the caveats about my limits of my knowledge that the that, that really the evidence base needs to be much more strongly built. So we're we're coming up towards the end of our time together, seven minutes left or so. Um, I did want to turn to audience questions. Um, and before we do do that, this is the organizational ethics consortium after all. Um, and so couldn't help myself but to mention, you know, just a few of the challenges, of course, that um, health organizations will face in taking this mantle on. Um, you see the common issue of priority setting, right? Um, which is usually wrapped up in the discourse about uh, no margin, no mission, right? So um, these, this work takes resources. Um, and as architecture looks to partnership with healthcare um, to be able to move the needle on some of this research implementation um, and practice, uh, how ought health organizations consider the relative priority to give to the built environment and the uh, um, opportunities to use it um, in different ways as part of their solutions to the mission of facilitating health for all of their patients. Um, so I'm just kind of dropping that out there because it's a key organizational dimension um, that we can't help but to mention in this consortium. Uh, I did want to maybe raise up one of the questions that Christine Mitchell had raised, which was with respect to ethical oversight of built environment design. We've got a lot of ethicists in the room. Um, so what kind of oversight do you think might be useful without being kind of unduly bureaucratic or without generating um, harmful effects? Well, right off the bat, I think we would all agree that at least disclosure of uh, some of these things that are being used in long-term care would be appropriate informed consent where possible. Um, but I'm not even sure, sure that 
the surrogate decision making is sufficient for making the kinds of decisions of where you're subjecting a person not just to a medical intervention or a line of treatment but to their entire lived experience the entire their entire life is being orchestrated like i'm not sure you know we talk about the problems with surrogate decision making that's one aspect of a person's life i'm not sure that's sufficient for doing this so i don't know if i mean stepping away from christine's question but i think that that what's important is that we look at this from the perspective of um, sort of an epistemic modesty about this. And going back to Pierre's point, we have to involve people. We have to involve people in these things because we don't really know how people feel about it. You know, and good facts make good evidence. We don't have good facts about this. And so I think before we can answer that question about what sort of framework we'd have to evaluate these things, you know, the, the first obligation is to understand if there's something going on here, what it is, what are the harms and what are the benefits? And then we can talk about what would be an appropriate way to have oversight of, of that. One of my uh, uh, mentors, Dr. Ray Pentecost, who was at Texas A&M University, um, it taught me the value of a very well-crafted question. And I would suggest that as administrators are evaluating the priorities associated with this, that they would be asking those kinds of deeper questions rather than how cheaply can we get this project done yesterday? Um, so this relates ultimately to the things that David was highlighting with respect to um, quality improvement, but asking the deeper questions I think will necessarily help the priority around investment uh, into some of these answers. But I don't know that um, answering these questions within the urgency of getting projects done is the right space to do that. I think that is a, uh, a predecessor exercise in, in really trying to solve some of this. Similarly, the results of these things um, good or bad really do need to be published. And the infrastructure associated with that publication is, is not very robust yet, as, as we had pointed out, uh, nor is the funding generally available. There are foundations that are uh, supporting this, the Foundation for Health Environment Research, for example, uh, but they hand out grants that are fairly small, uh, and 10, 20, 30,000 dollars uh, at most. So within the healthcare uh, research space uh, or within the architectural research space, those things simply don't exist yet. Uh, and we need much deeper research around this, uh, much deeper uh, infrastructure. Well, we've talked a lot, Kelsey, about uh, health systems that already measure never events, right? They're measuring, measuring surgical site infections, they're measuring falls, they're measuring different things in the healthcare environment. Could they go one step further, which I don't think would add a lot of cost to the current framework to measure whether those never events are happening in certain spaces versus others, if delirium is truly happening more frequently in the windowless rooms? And if that's the case, you might not need to spend all the money to move the intensive care unit or punch a hole in the brick wall, but maybe a virtual window that could be tested quite cheaply might be an interim solution that might have some at least interim benefit. So I think adding on measurements related to the built environment that health systems already really do acquire data on might be a first step to think about. Oh, well, thank you. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Charlotte to wrap us up. But this is sometimes we have a conversation in ethics where it feels like technology is getting away from us. It's moving too fast, right? We didn't have time to think about the values. Um, and, and this is an example where we can partner, right, um, in real time, thinking about what values ought to guide these interventions and what evidence ought to be generated to support them. So, um, Charlotte, will you share with us what's coming up and all of that? Thanks, Kelsey. I sure will. I want to thank you first. Thank you and thank our distinguished panel, Diana, Stowe, Bill, David, Pierre, really for a very informative and thought-provoking discussion. I think that the, the issues you've raised around the design of healthcare facilities and the differences you've shown can be made in clinical decision-making, patient experience, patient outcomes, 
are really a call to action for people here. And I think we've seen in the response of our audience that people are very interested in thinking further about these issues, have already contributed some thoughts uh, that are quite important. And I trust we'll be involved in moving this kind of inquiry forward in people's respective institutions. Um, to the audience, I also wanna thank you. Your thoughtful questions and comments will certainly inform the panel. And there is an intention to get back in touch with people in the Q&A. One reason we continue a dialogue with the um, panelists is knowing that there is a plan already discussed before this session that panelists wanted to follow up with questions. And so if by any chance we wouldn't be able to tell it's you when we look at the emails of people who are attending, please drop into the chat um, uh, your contact information. Uh, so I do wanna quickly before we close, give people an idea of next month's session with, which interestingly picks up on one theme from today's I mean, an aspect of today's discussion is the um, involvement of professionals from a field that are not usually uh, engaged in the kinds of ethical issues that we're discussing, but yet have an impact on patient care. And next month, we're going to explore another area like that. Um, the, in this case, our topic will be data ethics and related AI ethics. We'll hear from a multi-state hospital and clinical system that has designed a data ethics checklist and a related organizational infrastructure so that early consideration will be given to ethical issues in the development of projects using patient data. Uh, details of that panel will be posted on our website soon. But I think one thing we found particularly remarkable was, again, as in today, it was the data ethics professionals as the design professionals who brought to the attention of hospital leaders and the hospital ethics service how badly they wanted a way of considering ethical issues that they could see in the work they were being asked to do. So once again, that'll be February 24th. Uh, and we'll look forward to seeing you. Have a good weekend, and we are going to close now. Thanks. Bye-bye.